Good morning, this is Professor Robert Beverly for CS4558. Today we're going to talk about network telescopes. So what is a network telescope? These are also commonly in the literature called darknets. Note that we're not speaking about the dark or the deep web, but instead we're talking about portions of networks that have zero hosts active on them. Occasionally, we will also talk about gray nets. A gray net is a partially populated network, such that there are a few hosts. The analogy here is to telescopes in astronomy. So in astronomy, we point a telescope at a region of the sky, and we passively observe events of interest. Similarly, with a network telescope, we're going to point a telescope at a portion of the Internet's IP address space and passively observe what traffic arrives. Again, typically we'll run a network telescope on a net block or a network prefix or a collection of addresses which has never, at least in the history of the internet, had an active host. What this implies then is that all traffic that arrives at this network telescope is by definition in some ways anomalous. Following the astronomy theme, we talk about unsolicited traffic to unused regions of address space as internet background radiation, or IBR. Here's a picture of a network telescope. On the left we have the internet from which traffic arrives and a router which is advertising a prefix. Here our network telescope is pointed at the prefix 1.2 slash 16. The idea here is that 1.2 slash 16 is a network prefix that has no hosts. The only thing that is happening on that net block is that there's a machine that is passively capturing all of the traffic. So you can think of this as capturing a PCAP, doing a TCP dump, or doing a Wireshark capture. So this prefix is globally advertised to the internet. Traffic can be routed to it. Traffic arrives to it. But there's no hosts that can actually respond to any of the traffic. So what kinds of traffic might we expect to arrive at a network telescope? A large fraction of traffic that arrives at telescopes is scanning traffic. For example, we might see TCP SYN scans, ICMP ECHO scans. These come from often automated bots or other kinds of surveys that are looking for different kinds of services. For example, there may be bots that are trying to find SSH. Or maybe there's bots that are scanning the internet for telnet servers looking for a particular vulnerability. Similarly, researchers perform different kinds of census surveys. So there's the census project, there's ZMAP, there's host surveys from ISI, so on and so forth. These will scopes as they're trying to make a survey of what's available on the internet and they're scanning every single routed prefix. Another type of traffic that arrives at telescopes is misconfiguration traffic. For instance, if someone misconfigures their server with an address other than the one they intended, Sometimes software itself will have misconfigurations. These can cause traffic to arrive at the telescope. Finally, the third class of traffic that's interesting at telescopes is backscatter. We'll talk about backscatter in a moment. Here's some scanning traffic that arrived at a network telescope that we operate at NPS. I've changed the destination address here to be consistent with our example, so you'll note that all packets are arriving to a destination in 1.2.0.0 slash 16. The first thing that we see is a SYN to TCP port 23. Now, the next thing to note is, do we see an answer to this? No. Note that there's no SYN response, because there's no host actually at that IP address. In fact, among those 2 to the 16 possible addresses within that net block, there are zero hosts active. And we see that there are many different hosts being scanned. Here it appears that the hosts being scanned are being scanned at random. Sometimes you'll see sequential scans, but that's more unusual. Note also the timestamps on the left here. We can see, for instance, the first two packets both arrive within the same millisecond. These are likely <clears throat> coming from the same type of coordinated scan. We also note that there's many different services being scanned. 
whereas port 23 in the prior two packets were bots looking for open telnet clients, here we see a bot or something scanning for port 22 SSH and then we see something else immediately after scanning for open port 80 on a different host. These are all different hosts again on that darknet. Let's look at the bottom two packets. So in this packet, we see a SYNAC packet. This seems unusual. Similarly, in the next packet, we see a reset, a TCP reset packet. The immediate question you might ask is, why would we receive, be, or at least be observing, TCP SYNACs and TCP reset packets? These packets are only caused in response to another TCP packet. Since there's no hosts, what host could possibly have answered this SYNAC? The main reason we might see this kind of traffic is because of spoofed source IP packets. One of the problems of the internet architecture is that, there's <coughs> is that it's possible to fake the source, of IP uh, uh, the source address of IP packets. This is a common strategy used by attackers. Why do attackers choose to spoof their IP source packets? The reason is, is that this affords them a level of anonymity, but perhaps as importantly, it makes it much harder to block the attacks. For instance, an attacker during a DOS attack might use the following strategy. The attacker might send a high volume of packets. The destination address of the IP packet is the victim, and the source address is chosen randomly from the entire space of 2 to the 32 possible IP addresses. When the victim observes traffic, it looks like the traffic is coming from many, 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 many different hosts. But in fact, it could be coming from a single host. Again, this makes it much harder to actually tie the DOS attack to the actual source and additionally makes it hard to block the attack. So what happens when spoofed source addresses is an address that belongs to the telescope address block. Here's an example. So here the attacker is sending a TCP SYN. The IP destination is the victim and the IP source happens to be a source address that belongs not to the attacker but to the telescope. It's an address within the darknet's network prefix. That SYN packet travels across the network reaches the victim, and the victim's TCP stack does exactly what it's supposed to do. It sends a TCP SYNAC, trying to uh, complete part of the three-way handshake. Of course, the source here is the victim, and then the destination is the telescope. This shows how TCP SYNACs might arrive at the telescope. It's important to note that network telescopes monitor only a portion of the internet address space. Sometimes we'd like to estimate the global rate of some anomalous traffic. For instance, we might want to estimate the spread of some worm or figure out how fast it's actually sending packets on a global scale. This is actually fairly easy to estimate if we assume that the IP destinations used are selected uniformly at random. So for a network telescope monitoring a slash n prefix, the global rate can be estimated as whatever rate is arriving at the telescope times 2 to the n. For example, the UCSD telescope monitors a slash 8. This means that it monitors 1 256th of the entire internet. Let's say, for instance, that it's observing 10 uh, packets per second of SSH scanning traffic that's arriving from China. We might then estimate the global SSH scanning rate as 10 times 2 to the 8th or, to the 8th or 2, 2,560 packets per second. Now that we know a bit about telescopes, let's look at how they're actually used in a paper by Denodi. The observation here is that one can gain opportunistic insight from malware. Here, what we note is that most scanning malware doesn't discriminate. 
What do we mean by that? Well, a piece of malware will generally infect a host regardless of where it is physically in the world so long as that host is vulnerable. So it will equally infect, without bias, hosts in America or Russia or Egypt. Of course, there may be biases due to OS adoption rates and so on, but the idea here is that it's going to affect hosts all over the world. So what happens if we geolocate the source address of traffic arriving at the telescope? So we have a telescope, traffic is arriving, and we want to know where that traffic is arriving from. Here's an example taken from the paper. This is traffic arriving at the UCSD telescope that's been geolocated to Egypt. There's at least four questions in this plot that we might ask. The first is, we said that we did the geolocation, but how do we identify non-spoofed traffic? How do we know, in fact, that the <coughs> source addresses here are actually real? Or how do we know if this is backscatter or what's going on? The next question is, how do we actually geolocate IP source addresses? What did they use? Then, why is it diurnal? Why do we see this cyclic behavior? And why is there this drop-off in the middle? Well, for the last two questions, why it's diurnal, that's fairly straightforward. What we're seeing here is, of course, natural traffic behavior. From Egypt, there's a natural time of day when people are active and when people are asleep. And we see this actually present in the traffic coming at our telescope. The question about why there's a drop-off has to do with events that occurred of interest in this paper, or specifically the Arab Spring and some of the censorship. So let's next look at some of these questions about how to identify the different kinds of traffic arriving at the telescope. So remember, we talked about the categories of internet background radiation. We talked about scanning traffic, and we talked about backscatter, and we talked about other traffic, such as misconfiguration traffic. Here's that same data, but plotted in those three different categories. How did they make this <coughs> determination of what traffic belonged to what class? Well, it was actually fairly easy. For backscatter, they simply took all the packets that were TCP Synax, or TCP Resets, or TCP Echo Replies. Again, these have to be backscatter, because <clears throat> that's the only way these packets could have occurred. There's no hosts on the darknet. For Conficker, Conficker was a scanning worm that was very active at the time of this study. Conficker was easy to identify because it uses some distinct uh, traffic ports and packet sizes. So here, Conficker uses TCP port 445, and all of the packets from Conficker are 48 bytes. So using these uh, observations, what the paper says is, since we can actually observe events at a country remotely, can we make analysis of different kinds of events? In particular, what the Denoti paper does is an analysis of censorship-based outages. What they mean here are country-level events where the country is actually trying to take down parts of the internet access and perform censorship during particularly uh, turbulent times in their history. The studies under uh, this, this particular study looked at events during the Arab Spring in both Egypt and Libya when they were trying to cut off internet access. The idea in this paper is to correlate data plane traffic with control plane traffic. The control plane traffic is BGP traffic, which again is globally observable through some of these BGP looking glasses. And the neat part here is to be able to correlate data plane traffic. Normally, we wouldn't have monitors and traffic sensors in Egypt and Libya. However, the key insight here is that traffic from Egypt and Libya is visible at remote telescopes. So the traffic from Egypt and Libya is visible at the UCSD telescope simply because of all of the different kinds of scanning traffic that are present in infected hosts. So what happens is, when a country blocks at the data plane, it also blocks randomly scanning malware coming from that country. And this is visible at remote telescopes. 
Here's a picture, again, of the traffic from Egypt for a particular AS. And what we're observing here is the packet rate of unsolicited traffic. This correlates exactly with the visibility of BGP prefixes. So what happened during this particular time window was a censorship event where both the data plane and the control plane traffic were blocked. Thanks, and see you next time.